Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I don't know what it is about that music, but it always makes me smile. How many of you make, uh, found yourself smiling and kind of do a little neck roll like that when the music was going? Come on, you know you did. I had a flashback every time I hear that of Sanford and Son. You gotta be at least 40 years old to know what that is. But for those of you that are laughing, I know you're at least kind of in my era. So anyway, we're having fun today. Very excited about what God's doing in our We Are Family series. Kicked it off last Sunday and got a lot of really interesting feedback. Most of it was good for a change. Just kidding. I'm, I'm trying to get you laughing because today we're gonna have a lot of fun and I wanna make sure the well is primed and ready to go. So if you're ready to take notes but didn't get some of the notes on the way in, make sure you slip your hand up. The ushers will be moving through the auditorium to do that. While they're doing that, a quick reminder to those of you that are watching on the app today, uh, I wanna encourage you to go ahead and get ready to capture what God talks to you about as well. God's gonna do something great. So settle in right where you are. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, in fact, sometime, drop us a little note at sermons at lifelinkchurch.com and give us a little what, what, or what's going on inside of you as a result of what God does at Life, through Lifelink in your life. So thanks again for being on the journey with us. Uh, while they're doing that, uh, two, two specific things I do need to connect with you on as a church family. And I always try to bring a little uh, context of what's happening with our church family right to the top of the sermon because this is where we typically are really ready to hear what God is doing. And the vision of the house is very much a part of what God is doing, not just the sermon alone. So I'm asking that you would always be ready to capture even this part of the journey. So uh, two things this morning. One is our encounter prayer service. Prayer is a powerful part of God's plan for our lives. And Lifelink Church is a church built on the word of God and the power of prayer. And it's one of the reasons why you feel God when you're here is because God's people are praying in this house. And Jesus said his house will be called a house of prayer. But it's only a house of prayer if you're here to pray. And so tonight is our monthly uh, encounter prayer service. It's at seven. And we always do this on the second Sunday of every month. But this Sunday is a little bit different because we've invited Hal and Cheryl Sachs. Some of you know who they are and most of you perhaps don't but they are very important in the work of prayer, both around our, our state and around our nation. In fact, Cheryl Sachs has written two or three books on different dimensions of prayer. She just finished one called The Prayer Saturated Family. And so for those of you that are able to come tonight, Lifelink Church wants to invest one of these books into every household that's here at her service tonight uh, during the Encounter Prayer Service. So please come and make yourself available of this. God's gonna do something both in the service and I believe in the book uh, as you start into that. And then lastly, the School of Ministry, we talked about our open enrollment in the month of August because Lifelink School of Ministry is kicking off in September. Many of you expressed interest and had lots of questions. So what we did is we put together a, a question and answer session at the end of this service at about 15 minutes after the service is dismissed. Those of you that are interested, please uh, uh, make your way over to Pastor Tom, what room is that? The Student Center, which is just on this side of the campus. Uh, we'll kick that information center uh, meeting off and make sure you have all the information needed for that. All right. The family series, We Are Family, is a big part of how God's working in our lives this fall. And last Sunday, we started with the context of what's God, what is God doing in the context of family? And so that was a, an insightful foray into that. Today, we're going to dig a little deeper into it and talk about what underwrites family, which is the context of covenant. Everyone say covenant. And we're going to look at things that uh, happen in our culture that strain the context of covenant and make marriage harder than it should be. And then we're going to look at the way God designed covenant to work in marriage and highlight the difference between what the world says about marriage and what God says about how it's supposed to work and why one of them has a future. God's way. So I hope today that you'll find this is insightful. A couple of things that I'll, I'll you know, tee the, the topic up with this morning that we find that strange marriage, some of them are unique to our era. For example, I was reading some uh, information and research on, uh, from divorce courts, and they say that in divorce court documents of today, one of the most common words found listed in the cause for divorce is the word Facebook. Interesting how something as innocuous as Facebook is actually a precipitating divider of people. And it's because there is, the, there is an avenue, an unaccountable avenue for you to begin to connect with other people who aren't your spouse to share parts of your life that actually don't belong with anybody other than God and your spouse. And interestingly enough, they, there are some other st uh, statistics that said based on the metadata they can track. They said as they track people on social media late at night and divorce, uh, at, at, uh, at 
social media late at night and the divorce rate, they said if you're online after the normal bedtime, they can statistically predict a time range for your divorce proceedings to begin. What's that saying? Whatever your normal bedtime is, turn the thing off. Plug into your husband or wife or family and turn, ever, turn the world off. And let's let God do something great in your home. Why not let God create the Garden of Eden in the four walls of your home and let him do it his way? Which brings us to what we're going to talk about today. The things about, um, the, 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 well, we're going to talk about covenant. But one of the, I'm so excited about every part of this sermon. I'm trying to preach it all at once. Can y'all tell? And so anyway, as we're going through this, so that was something that's unique to our era. But, but something that's been around a long time that marriages struggle with is the idea that once we say I do, we quit dating each other. And we quit doing the things that brought us together in the first place. So our creative team got together, and I'm very excited about this. They put together a date night starter kit for everybody to take with you on the way out. Why? Because we want your marriage to be hot, hot, hot. And some of you need a little Kickstarter in the hot department. And so uh, you can find everything you need, including the confetti that goes with it in the date night starter pack. So thank you to our creative team. This is free on your way out. I encourage you to take one of those. All right. Are you ready to let God start doing some surgery on you? All right. Good. Now that you're all warmed up and laughing a little bit, let the cutting begin. I'm just kidding. Let's pray. Jesus, be with us today as we go into your word. We're so excited about who you are and how you work. Let your word come alive in a way that changes, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start today in Mark chapter 10, verse, verses 6 through 9. Jesus is explaining some things, and he says it this way. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mouth, mother, father and mouth. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. We're getting the Disney Channel. <laughs> be united to his wife, and the two will become one what? One flesh. So they are no longer two but one, all right? And therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. If you've been to a wedding lately and you've heard those phrases, you wonder where that context came from, came right out of the mouth of Christ. Let what God has joined together, don't let anybody tear it apart. Some, of, some people will listen to that context and say, well, that's God's version of, and they lived happily ever after. And it would seem like that, but a lot of times we find out that some of the things that we experience on the way to, to I do begins to set us up for some interesting context. And so what we want to do is just take a look and see what's going on in our own marriage for those of us who are married in here today. Others who aren't be listening for the dynamics of how this works for the marriage that God's probably preparing you for. And then others who don't ever intend to be married, these same dynamics and principles work pretty effectively in friendships and other dynamics as well. So this is a, applicable to everyone today. But you think about this, how the, the marriage that you had, didn't it start by being attracted to someone and then dreaming a little bit together? <clears throat> it started that way. And then as you were imagining what your marriage was gonna be like, you probably started imagining all the things that you thought would just be a part of, of marriage. And so you would, you would think about this and, and you would talk about, oh, I imagine this is gonna happen and I imagine that's gonna happen. And there were some common interests that you begin to talk about. Things like a home, you, you dream and I, I just imagine we're gonna have a home together. And it, it may not be a big home, may not be much bigger than this one to begin with, but eventually we'll, we'll kind of settle in, we'll get our stuff together. And then we'll move to a bigger home, and, and that's just something I imagine will happen. And I imagine uh, that at, in that home, we might have some, uh, some kiddos, and we might have some things like that. Or maybe you imagine the world has got enough kids, and you don't want any kids at all. Or maybe you want two, and she wants four. Or maybe you want six, and she's like, whose body's having these kids? I don't think so. But you just have things that you imagine about what's going to be like with the, with the kids. Other things you just might imagine that, you know, based on some things your mama did, that you just imagine things kind of work a certain way at your house, and they may or may not work that way, um, other aspects of your marriage that you just think, this is how a home is supposed to work. I think, I just imagine that she does all this stuff, and I, th all of a sudden, this room is getting really quiet, all of a sudden, but keep laughing, you're going to need it. So anyway, just the things that you feel like, that you imagine is supposed to, to, to work, and I just imagine we're going to be able to go on vacations every year, and it's just going to be awesome, and can we just, we're going to go from one vacation to the next, it'll be Disney one year, and a cruise the next, and the Alpine 
uh, skiing the next year, and then we're going to go to Europe, and then we're going to go to do this, and oh, it's just going to be one. We just imagine all these things, and, and then you imagine that someday you'll have enough of this, so you can maybe drive one of these. You know, I'm talking about everyone, and your little Yugo that you started with turns into a Maserati, and just the way you imagine. And then, guys, that you, uh, uh, there, you know, you just imagine that your wife is going to come to bed wearing something other than something that looks like this. And ladies, you're like, oh, I imagine my husband won't care what I wear because he just wants me to be comfortable and, and he just loves me for who I am. And we just imagine all kind of crazy things, right? So we have all these things that we imagine because these are our desires. These are the things that we come to marriage desiring because that's just what we imagine that things are gonna be like. Did everybody on this side see that? Desires, desires. Someday we'll have a video system that everybody can see everything. But until then, let your imagination run wild. So all of these things happen. So we come, to the, come into the marriage and we walk down the aisle with all of these things that we've imagined. And then we say, I do. And somewhere between the I do and the back of the church on the way out or the end of the honeymoon or... <laughs> You know, three months into the marriage or by the time the first child gets here, something about I do has become, well, I thought you were going to do that. And my, I, my desires have become my expectations. And I just expect that you're going to work and make me a lot of money because that's what married people do. And so I'm, I just expected that. And I actually was expecting that I would come home to a clean house. And that was just what I just was expecting to do. And, and I had expectations for the number of kids or the fact that we would have kids or not. And, and I expected, you know, we would have a, a home that we dream of. And when are we going to get that home? You know, when, when will that home finally get here? I mean, I married you because this was what we were going to do. And, and this is something you said that you would do for me. And so I'm expecting that. And, and what about those vacations? You know, we've, we've been to the Phoenix Zoo. <laughs> but, but there's other things west of Phoenix from here, like Disney, you know, and for those... And what about the things that we dream of, the, a little finer things in life that represented by different aspects and things? And then, and of course, you know, I, I just imagined that, you know, this was not going to be what I looked at every night. And of course, I just had different kind of ideas. I had one of the ladies tell me after the end of the first service, Pastor Dave, you should get Pastor Cherie to put a box together instead of the box you're putting together. But hey, I got to preach the way I preach. And so there you have it. <laughs> But the bottom line is, here, we, we end up coming in. <laughs> Y'all still okay? <laughs> My wife actually loves me, believe it or not. I know it's hard to believe, but she does. Bless her heart. <laughs> but we innocently, we innocently start thinking uh, into a marriage, thinking of all the things that we imagine will happen. And without thinking of it, they actually move from desires to expectations. And when this happens, everyone, here's what happens. The spirit of our relationship changes. See, what started out is two people in love with each other, dreaming together of all the things that could be, turns into a debt, debtor relationship of all the things you're supposed to be doing for me. And it changes the dynamic to a, a relational arrangement that God did not ever intend for us to experience. This is how the world sees it. If you just make enough money, then you'd be okay. If you just get the right kind of home, then you'd be okay. If you just do this, if you just, if you just make me happy, then I would stay in this marriage. But since you won't, then whatever, whatever. And what, what happens in the, in the dynamic of this debt debtor relationship is that there's a sense of you owe me something. You owe me something. You may not say it that way. But it's the nuance that comes out of your facial expressions. It's the way that you treat with the, sho the cold shoulder or the harsh tones or the yelling or the silent. It's the way that we treat one another. You owe me. You owe me. And you owe me is the beginning of the, f of the fraying of the edges of what started out as a life-giving marriage. But without realizing what's actually taking it apart, there is a force working that's like chains of debt around the soul and the heart of your marriage. And it's because the relationship is not arranged correctly. It's not aligned correctly. 
And what started out as a covenant becomes a contract. And what started out as unconditional becomes very conditional. And you can just tell. Sometimes there's good days and a lot of times there's not. And it may not be bad all the time, but you can just tell that there's an undertow of something happening. And I'm aware of it. I may even be alarmed by it. But the harder I try to fix it, the worse it actually becomes. And all I can tell you is more of the same harder will never get the job done. There is a different solution that God has for us. And that's one of the reasons why I want to talk about today what's really going on. James chapter 4 verse 1 says it this way. Do you know where your fights and arguments come from? They come from the, what's the words? Selfish desires that war within us. You want many things, but you do not have them. So you're ready to kill and are jealous of other people. But you still cannot get what you Want. So you argue and fight. You do not get what you want because you do not ask God. In other words, he's saying, hey, you're looking in a different direction than the source I created for the actual needs of your life. And I know that you expect this because you're in a Christian, Bible-based, Christ-centered church. You're going to expect me to say this, but I am obliged by the word of God to say there is always only one source for the true needs in the soul of a man or woman. And God is the only one that can actually fulfill what drives us from the context of needs. It wears many faces. I need sex. I need friendship. I need money. I need that type of house. I need that type of relationship. I need this type of cooking. I need this type of, I need that type of outfit. I need these types of shoes. I mean, it, need has lots of faces but deep in its core of, who it is, of what it is, it actually can only ever be satisfied by one source, and that is God. And God wants you to know this morning that if you are pouring your life into the energy it takes to try to get your husband or wife to do what you want them to do or be what you want them to be so that you think you'll be happy, it's energy spent down the wrong path. Amen. What you really have is an eye problem. I want you to imagine that that type of relationship where a husband and a wife is relating to each other based on expectations, what you really have is two big capital I's banging away at each other trying to get them to do what the other one wants. I want this. I want that. And it may not come across like I want this, but it may be like, hmm. <laughs> well, two can play that game. Or it, or it may be, ah! I have no idea what the intensity of your home is, but I will tell you this, that a home that's not built in the pattern God's gonna show us today will eventually become intense, whether it's volume or silence, but both of them will kill. God wants your marriage to thrive, but it can only thrive based on one thing, and it's not two big eyes banging away on each other. See, God designed marriage to be two little eyes working in relationship with a third person in the marriage. When God created Adam and Eve, he did so in the Garden of Eden, in the beginning. How many people were in that scenario? Adam, Eve, and God. God has to be in, in the relationship and he has to be in his place. He has to be in his place. If God's not in his place, then all you'll ever get is two capital I's working back and forth on each other, trying to get each other to do that. And then what happens is sometimes we as Christians try to figure out how to make it a Christian marriage by zinging Bible verses at each other. Well, the Bible says you're supposed to submit. And the Bible says, Phew, pow, obey me, woman. The Bible says you're supposed to love me like Christ of the church. Pew! We throw these Christian darts at each other thinking that that's what makes a marriage a Christian marriage. But that isn't what makes a Christian marriage. That's just, that's just two big capital I's wearing a cross around their necks. Even that, throwing Bible verses at each other to manipulate each other is not what the Bible says or God's saying in the Bible, here's how I want this to work. What is God really saying? 
What is God really saying? Well, the bottom line is you gotta get to the issue of who owes who what. So what I wanna ask you this morning as we transition into some practical stuff is, write this down, what do you think your wife or husband owes you? What do you think your wife or husband owes you? And I'm not gonna ask you to write it down there. I'm gonna ask you to ask the question of yourself. What does my wife owe me? Because whatever is in your expectation box, it's what's standing between you and experiencing how God designed marriage to be, to be enjoyed. If you have something in your expectation box that's aimed at what you think your husband or wife can, can do for you to make you happy, there's something standing between you and what God has for you. I'm just gonna let that set for a couple of seconds because I want you to see that God has a practical answer to this. And again, whether you're married right now or whether you used to be married and you're thinking about getting married again, whether you will be married someday, I want you to know that there is a way to actually align yourself with the way God designed marriage to be worked so you enjoy the benefit and the blessing of what his covenant really is. Let me give you this. The, Bible, the biblical Christian answer to that question, what does your husband or wife owe you, is Nothing. Write that down, nothing. From a biblical perspective, my wife owes me nothing. From a biblical perspective, Cherie's husband owes her nothing. Nothing. You might be thinking, where does that come from? I'm gonna give you a quick look through Ephesians chapter five, and I'm gonna look at this from a slightly different perspective because it may provide some handles for you to hold on to this idea. But here's where this context come from. Ephesians chapter five, verse 21 says this, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So the idea of submitting to each other is the very first thing we see in Ephesians chapter five. When it comes to the issue of how husbands and wives are supposed to work to each other, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let me give you a working definition that may help because a lot of times people think submission is blind, mindless obedience to irrational demands of my husband or wife, and that's not what I'm talking about at all. Submission could be thought of as this way. In fact, if you're taking notes, write this down. I'm going to make your desires a priority over mine. I'm going to make your desires a priority over mine. So when it comes to we've got competing desires, whose desire is going to win, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, your desire wins. Why? Because I'm going to submit my desires under your desires. I'm going to submit my desires. And I'm going to do that as unto the Lord. How? 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 How can I do that? And I will say this. As long as you're looking at the behavior or the attitudes of your husband or wife, you really aren't gonna be able to do this. You have to be looking at something else to do this. And this is where the, the turn in the sermon is. I need you to hear this. I'm not saying I don't have desires. I'm not saying I'm a mindless puddle of mush with no drive or initiative or any, any kind of desires. I'm saying I have them, but when it comes to my relationship with my wife, in the context of this scripture, the Bible says I'm supposed to submit them under hers in reverence to Christ. And that's the key. I want you to see this. I have to do that out of reverence to Christ. How do you do that, Pastor Dave? Because you clearly are not married to my husband. Pastor Dave, you're clearly not married to my wife. If you knew how my wife treated me, you knew how my husband treated me. And I, listen, let me just say this before I plow into the rest of this. I'm not naive to pain. I've been an ordained minister since 1989. And my wife and I have been on the receiving end of countless texts and phone calls. We've walked through the trials and the struggles and the pain and the fractured relationships and the mess that sin causes. We've walked through all of, all of it. So when I'm, when I'm bringing this to you this morning, it is not from the out-of-touch perspective of an ivory palace. I want you to know this morning, we've been through that. 
Almost nobody ever calls us and says, hey, just checking in, Pastor Dave. You know, my marriage is on top shelf today. Everything is fantastic. By the way, just want you to know, this is a phenomenal day I'm having. You know what the calls we get? Pastor Dave, my life is off the hooks. My life, all the wheels fell off of my marriage today. Pastor Dave, my husband's looking at porn. Can you fix him? Pastor Dave, my wife is on drugs. Can you help her? Pastor Dave, my kids are this. Pastor Dave, my... And I'm saying, as, a, as an ordained pastor, it is life's greatest privilege to be invited into somebody's pain. So I'm not saying that at all from the context of begrudging any of it. That is an honor to be done. I'm just saying I've been there. And I know this is not an easy sermon to think of. But what I'm hoping that you hear more than anything is the sound of hope itself because God has a way this is supposed to work. And while you cannot control in any way, shape, or form the actions and the behaviors of a husband or a wife, and we try. I got to keep my husband on a, tight, on a tight rope, Pastor Dave. You have no idea. If I give him a little inch, he'll take a mile. You know, there's something called, that's called Parenting. That's next week. I'm talking about the way God wants your marriage to be a life-giving marriage. And he's, he's basically saying this, as long as you're looking at him, or as long as you're looking at her, you're probably not gonna be able to submit your desires under his or hers because you'll think they're getting ahead. Where do I look, Pastor Dave? Well, funny, you should ask. It took you long enough. <clears throat> Let me give you, a, I think, a perspective that might help. God is basically saying to us, all right, Lonre, in light of all I've done for you, in light of salvation that I gave you, Lonre, I want you to remember when you were sinning in my face, I'm hanging on the cross for you. I, I want you to remember, I knew everything you thought, did, and still keep doing. I knew all of that, and I want you to know I loved you enough to give you salvation. That's grace. And Lonnie, I want you to know you cannot earn it. You can't do anything about it. You cannot ever merit that. You can't pay me back for it by saying, then I'll die for you. You can't do any of those things. Why? Because you didn't earn it. I gave it to you. It's grace. And I'm not giving you what you really deserve. You deserve hell. You deserve death. You deserve eternal punishment. You deserve eternal separation from my goodness. You deserve all that. I'm not giving you any of that. I'm giving you grace. I'm giving you debt free relationship. I just picked Lonre. Aren't you glad I didn't pick you? <laughs> but that's what God is saying. In light of all that I've done for you, this is what I want you to do now. And so you may go, God, you know, I'm thinking about all the things you've done for me. You've saved me. You gave me grace. You gave me forgiveness. You gave me eternal life. I didn't deserve any of that. You gave me all of that, God. And in light of that, I'm so grateful, Lord. I'm thankful that you didn't give me what I really deserve, which I deserve hell. I deserve damnation. I deserve eternal separation from you. I deserve your cosmic cold shoulder, God. I deserve all that because I sinned in your face and I did all that. And you were so amazing, God. You gave me grace and you gave me life and you loved me. You did all of that. I'm so thankful, God. How can I pay you back? And God would say to you this. I want you to take all that gratitude, and I want you to take all that passion, and I want you to rain it down on your wife. Oh, no, God. I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about you. You were so good to me. You forgave me. You did, how can I pay you back? I heard you the first time. I want you to take all that gratitude and all that passion that you're giving my way and I want you to pour it out on your husband. That jerk? God, you clearly don't know my husband. I mean you. Think, this isn't about him. I want you to tell me how I can repay you. And he says, I want you to take all your gratitude and all your passion and I want you to pour it out on your husband or wife. No strings attached. You're like, can, can I just give a little bit more in the offering or something? Can, I can go on a mission trip. How would that do? 
You mean, God, you actually care about my relationship? I don't, this, I don't want to deal with her. That, can't we just have a little good thing going just you and me? And God says, no, you can't. Because the way you treat her is the way you're treating me. I don't know if they put that up on the screen, but if you're taking notes, write this down. God is saying to you, I want you to take all the gratitude and passion you have on the inside of you for what I did for you and shower it down on your spouse. What am I saying? As long as you're looking at your husband or wife to try to figure out how to submit your desires under his or hers, you don't have a chance. The only way to do that is to say, God, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at all you did for me, no strings attached. I'm looking at what you did for me. And in light of that, you want me to pour my gratitude out in loving kindness to my husband or wife. And God says, now we're talking. Now we got it. I want you to give him or her a debt-free relationship where you say, you know what? I realize, sweetheart, I've been holding things over your head. I realize, honey, that I have been thinking this the wrong way. I realize I've had expectations on you that you could never meet. I realize that you're never going to be equipped to actually do the things that are in my heart. I realize that I've had wrong expectations, and that's put you in bondage. I realize that I've had chains around your soul. And it's eroded our friendship and our relationship. I realize that what I've done by my actions and my words have layered you with expectations. And though these are legitimate desires, I've actually been causing them to be expectations of you. And this is what you felt. So today, because of my gratitude for what Jesus did for me, no strings attached. Because only he and I know what he really forgave me from. And because of that, I want you to know that I have a debt-free love for you. Debt-free love for you. My, my whole, and, and guys, that's the bottom line to the message today. Because we end up looking at each other and pounding away on each other, trying to figure out how to maneuver each other. And God says, no. You look to me. And don't you dare be a contract to each other. Why? Because you're killing your covenant. You're killing the way I work in a marriage. Don't lay demands on each other. Look to me and unconditionally love each other. That's what he says first. And then, then he gets really specific. He looks right at wives in verse 22 and he says, wives, He's so great. No. He said, oh, no. Submit to your husbands. Remember, submit your desires under his. Submit to your husbands. How? As to the Lord. What's he saying? Remember, you keep looking at me, and you pour your gratitude out to me on him. And then he moves forward. He talks to husbands. Husbands, (laughs) you love your wives because she deserves it. No. It's, oh, no. You love your wives, but then he, and listen, men get the short end of the stick. So, so often we think women get the short end of the stick here because the word submit is in there. But really submit was to both of us to begin with. And then he just echoes it again like, ladies, you get a pastor because I've already told you this, but I still want you to do it. Now, men, I'm coming for you. you got to die for her. What do I mean? I want you to love her like I loved you. How did I love you? I gave up what was rightfully mine. I gave it all up. What does that mean, Pastor Dave? That means to men, we got to give up our gadgets, got to give up the golf if we need to, ESPN if we need to. We got whatever, whatever your wife feels like is above her, it's got to go. I 
like, I'm never coming to this church again. <laughs> no, you can have what you've always had. Or you can have what God has for you. All your wife needs to know is that she's not second to something. She doesn't care if you play golf. It just can't be first. She just needs to know she's first. Does that make sense? And God's saying to the men, listen, give it up. You give your life away to meet the desire she has. And really what he's saying to both of us, husbands and wives, spend your energy in gratitude to me pouring into each other's lives all your energy to try to figure out how can I meet that desire. And some of it won't be ever, ever able to be met, and that's okay because your heart's going the right direction. But that's what God is saying. I want you to take the debt-free relationship you have with me, and I want you to project it into your marriage. And you treat your wife and you treat your husband the way I treat you. What's he saying? Christian marriages, write this down, are not lived under the shadow of two big eyes. Christian marriages live under the shadow of a cross. We live and we conduct our choices, our attitudes, our, our words, our actions. We do all that in the same spirit and mannerism. Christ did that for us. Imagine what your relationship could be like. Imagine what a marriage could actually be like without the tyranny of this. What would it be like if you came home every, every night and instead of, well, did you do that? Well, did you do this? Well, did you get that done? Well, did you do this? Well, of course you didn't. Of course you didn't. Of course that's not done either. And of course this. And imagine what your life would be like if, if you came home and both the husband and the wife are like saying, sweetheart, I'm home. You know, I was thinking about God today and how good he's been to us. And it, I drove, I sped all the way home. Don't tell Pastor Dave, but I sped all the way home. I couldn't wait to get home. Why? Because I want you to know how much he loves you. In fact, let me give you one more feeling. God created marriage so my husband or wife can know what his love feels like in a tangible, physical sort of way. What am I saying? Guys, God gave you your wife not so that she could make you happy. He gave you your wife so that she could know what his love feels like with skin on it. How are you doing? Ladies, God did not give you your husband so he could just meet your needs and provide everything that you think you need from a husband. You know why he gave you a husband? So you could show him what God's love feels like in a practical, tangible, right here with you sort of way. See, every one of us in a church service will raise our hands and just sing and feel the goosebumps that go with it, communing with the presence of God and all that's fine, but God said, that's easy. That's almost cheating, it's so easy. You know what real love is? looking right down the challenge of what I'm saying and say, I want you to know, no strings attached. If I get nothing out of this, you're gonna know what the love of God feels like. Does that make sense? What would happen if a husband and a wife had a marriage like that? What do you think the children in a home like that could be like? You're like, Pastor David, this is so past the possibility. We're, I've been married three times and I've been this and my kids are jacked and I'm messed up. And, I, and I'm saying, listen, you can't do anything about the past. You know what you get to do about it? Right now and tomorrow. You know who gets to own the past? Thankfully for us, our Savior, Jesus, who the Bible says in, in Revelation is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, which means Jesus showed up in his ex original expression as our redeemer, which means he wants to take all the mess in your life and redeem it. God can do that. So when it comes to marriage, you guys, the world's got it wrong. It's not about arm candy. It's not about stuff. It's not about proving your, your stuff to people. It's not about the Joneses. It's not about the, the things you can experience together. To, ooh, what about this and what about that? It's not about that. It's do you realize that God gave you to your spouse so that she would know what his love feels like with skin on? Listen, I'm telling you, nothing has revolutionized my attitude towards my wife than that one idea. 
God is looking at me and said, David, I gave you to Cherie so she knows what my love feels like with skin on it. Don't you mess this up. You remember what I did for you? Remember what you hope nobody finds out? Remember all the stuff you're grateful for? Pour it all on her. The truth is, I got the easy part. She's got the hard part. I'm the bonehead. She's easy to love, to be honest with you. But that changed the way I look at marriage. My wife owes me nothing. I have no agreement with her. I have a covenant with her. That I will spend every moment, every breath, every ounce of energy, I will do all that in light of what God has done for me. I will pour that out on her. And the truth is, that's exactly how she does for me too. Why? Because now after almost 30 years of marriage, lots of bumpy roads, lots of scriptures and devotions, counseling sessions we've been through, coaching, the Bible, the Holy Spirit, it just dawned on us. If we want what God designed, we got to go his way. And you know what we want? God's best. Now, the truth is, a lot of what I've been talking about is, uh, the, it's got layers that come downstream from that. So what I, wa- I want you to know this, this, in September, we're starting our equipped classes. And we're actually offering a marriage class on Tuesday nights. And we're actually gonna take the Tuesday nights of September, October, and first part of November in our equipped class. And we're gonna work on marriage together for those of you who feel like, hey, I'm gonna invest this season into my marriage. Okay, so that's gonna be available. There are other classes being offered on Tuesday and Wednesday this, this uh, uh, semester that's designed to help increase your strength and, and understanding and wisdom and experience and expression of God's truth in different areas of your life. But we're also gonna be offering the one on marriage. So I wanna encourage you to participate in that if marriage is what you're working on. Bottom line is this. When it comes to a marriage, there's two people. There's a husband and a wife. And if you're the husband, you can't, you can't actually control the wife. You only get to make your choice. If you're a wife, you can't control the husband. You only get to make your choice. And I'm saying if you'll turn your attention to God, you can actually do what we've been talking about today. As long as you're looking at what he's done for you. So let's talk about that. How are you doing with God? How are you doing? Because that's really the key. Just to kind of bring this sermon in for a landing, I want you to know that the hope of every, every topic we ever talk about, the answer to everything ultimately comes down to how are you doing with Jesus? Because behavior, you can't just fix behavior. You gotta go to the root of it. How are you doing with God? Let me just tell you, look at me in the eyes for a second. In less than two minutes, I'm gonna offer a prayer for every person in here who knows I need to be in a different place with God. Everybody in this church that knows me thinks I'm in a good spot with God, but the truth is I know deep inside I need to be in a different spot with God. I need a fresh start. Maybe you're visiting, it's like nobody knows me, but here I am and I know I'm not right with God. I need to make a decision to follow Jesus. Nobody can make the decision but you. With every head up and every eye open, I'm telling you right now, In about a minute and a half, we're going to pray that prayer. You know what I believe? I believe there are dozens of people in here today that there's a unique grace. I've never done this like this. I didn't do it in the first service, but this second service, there's something unique here, and you're here in the context of something God wants to do. God wants to radically transform your life and your marriage and your family, the way you do friendships, all of it. And it's going to come from you being willing to say yes to a fresh start with Jesus today. You ready? I'm going to count to three. Now look at me real quick. One, this isn't, it's not complicated. You're either where you're supposed to be with God or you're not. And honestly, you know. Two, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Everybody's going to be looking and it won't matter because they can't do a thing about your soul. Only Jesus can. I'm not going to ask you to stand up and move to the front but I am going to ask you to raise your hand. And I believe many in this room today are about to say yes to Jesus in a fresh new way. And to be honest with you, I don't care if you're an elder, a pastor, a life group leader, a staff member, don't care. There's unique grace here. Ready? 
Who's ready to say yes? Three, hands up. Come on, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Now I got to count, so leave your hand up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, thank you very much. All right, guys, we're going to pray. I'm going to ask everyone to pray. Pray out loud. Let's pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for being good to me and giving me truth like I need to hear it. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today, I'm asking you to forgive me for all of my sins, to wash me, cleanse me, and make me brand new. I'm deciding today to follow you. No turning back. In Jesus' name, amen. Ready? Come on, put them hands together. Thank you for watching the LifeLink Church video podcast. It's our prayer that you heard a word from God today. If you have a story to share about how God is working in your life, then let us know and send us an email at mystory at lifelinkchurch.com.